I'm Maddie Lee, Thunder beat writer for The Oklahoman, and today I'm joined by columnist Barry Trammell and fellow beat writer Eric Horn, and we're talking trade deadline, guys. A lot has happened today. Honestly, a lot has happened in the past week, but let's get it out of the way first. Something that did not happen, Anthony Davis did not move. Barry, what does this lack of movement say for the teams involved, the Lakers, Boston, the other teams who are involved? And, and interested in AD? Well, I, I think uh, what it says is that the Pelicans knew that their, uh, their position of strength in getting the best deal they could, it's only going to get better as, the, uh, as we get near June. There was no pressing uh, uh, matter to, to make the Pelicans do a deal. Now, the only thing they really, uh, so they accomplished two things. They kept Boston in the, in the bidding and they put the screws to the Lakers. Um, you know, any morsel of information that came in terms of, uh, you know, the Lakers wanting to give, you, give New Orleans this, this, and this, New Orleans, you know, shouted it out to the world, try to uh, submarine the Lakers' season, uh, retribution for what they think is tampering, trying to get uh, a superstar like Anthony Davis. So some of this was vindictive, but it was also just solid strategy. Boston can't trade for Anthony Davis because of the collective bargaining agreement. They can do it. Uh, after the season, so in June, we'll see this uh, this whole thing start up again, and Boston, uh, you know, may be able to trump that Laker offer. Oh. Eric, if you're the Pelicans and you have AD on your roster, and you've gone through all of this, you know that he's you're getting rid of him soon. What do you do with him? At well, this point? I, I'd send him home because uh, every game that he plays, and Anthony Davis says he intends on playing the rest of the season with the Pelicans. Every game he plays, he's putting himself in as an injury risk. Now, granted, I think teams are still going to want to trade for Anthony Davis, whether he's injured or not, but that's still going to be a weird locker room dynamic. That's going to be a weird player-coach dynamic. Um, that's going to be a situation where a guy is playing games that are utterly meaningless. And frankly, you don't want Anthony Davis out there if you're the New Orleans Pelicans because he's going to help you win games. So you want that guy sitting at home helping you get a better lottery pick. And then, look, with the situation with the Knicks, and how bad the Knicks are, a team that Anthony Davis is reportedly interested in going to as well. Uh, you know, the Knicks, uh, the Knicks, the, the Lakers, the Celtics, all interested in Anthony Davis. The, the Pelicans, as Barry said, have every incentive to wait until the offseason for Anthony Davis to trade him because they're going to know where all the draft picks fall. They're going to know if the Knicks have the number one pick in Zion Williamson. They're going to know, you know where some of those Boston picks are going to land because Boston has 8,000 first round picks. So. It's a situation where you need Anthony Davis to sit his butt at home. It doesn't seem right to keep a guy from playing ball. But look, Anthony Davis and his representation said, look, we're going to demand the trade in the middle of the season. So the Pelicans have every right to say, all right, you're not playing for us. Yeah, all bets are pretty much off after you pull that move. All right, done with things that didn't happen. Let's move on to all the craziness of today. You have teams like Washington that look nothing like they did a couple days ago. For you, Eric, who are the biggest winners on this trade deadline day? Milwaukee Bucks, big time win for them. They were already the best team in the league record-wise, and in terms of uh, you know point differential per 100 possessions, best team in the East, even better than the Warriors in terms of record and point differential. Uh, they've got the possible MVP of the league in Giannis. Um, they shoot the they shoot the ball like crazy from three. Um, you know, Mike Budenholzer is doing a great job. He's probably going to be the coach of the year. And then they add a guy like Nikola Mirotic from the floundering Pelicans, and they don't even have to give up a first rounder to get him. That's a big time move for them. That's a guy that can come off the bench and, and, and play a power forward for them. That's a guy who can start at power forward alongside Giannis if they want to put Brooke Lopez on the bench and start Giannis at center. I mean, they've got some really versatile lineups. They've got some lineups that can really space the floor around Giannis, who isn't a great three-point shooter, but is a guy who can get to the rim you know, as much as he wants because he has so much space to work with. That's a dangerous team going into the playoffs with as much offensive firepower as they have, not to mention they're already one of the best defensive teams in the league, too. So the Bucks are a clear winner at the trade deadline. Who do you like, Barry? Well, in addition to Milwaukee, you got to like what Philadelphia did. I mean, adding Tobias Harris to that starting lineup, they've got a, they've got a Golden State Warrior type starting lineup with four, uh, four close or actual All Stars, uh, plus JJ Redick. Uh, you're talking about Tobias Harris, Jimmy Butler, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, JJ Redick. That's a heck of a starting lineup, the best this side of Oakland. So, uh, now Philly hurt its depth, made some trades today. Markel Fultz goes down to Orlando. Jonathan Simmons goes back to the Sixers. 
maybe Simmons can fortify them a little bit. So depth is going to be an issue with Philadelphia come the playoffs. Uh, but that's a heck of a starting lineup, one that trumps anything in the East. Obviously, when it comes to trades, ideally both teams get something out of each of it. And we'll have to wait and see how some of these these picks pan out, frankly. But right now, the way that things are looking, Barry, who do you think really didn't do themselves any favors for this trade deadline? Well, I mean, most teams got what they wanted. You know, teams like the, the Wizards just tearing down. Teams like the Clippers and the Mavericks saying, hey, we don't want to make the playoffs. We, you know, take, take some of our good players. We, we don't want to make the playoffs. That's, you know, that's backward thinking in my mind, but that's their plan and that's what they want to do. And they successfully uh, achieved their plan. They, uh, you know, the, even a team like Memphis, which uh, sent Mark Gasol to a foreign country. You know, to me, that was, it's a sad day in Memphis, but they got a pretty good haul back with, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with what they got from the Raptors. So very few teams come away from this trade deadline thinking, now ah, this didn't go good at all. Um, it's, it's, it, if you're a fan, it's different, though, because you look at the Clippers. They're in eighth place in the West. They're in the playoffs with a, most people would say, the best chance by far to get at, to, to stay in the playoff race. And the Clippers wave the white flag. They don't want to make the playoffs. If Dallas hadn't torn down its roster, Dallas could make a playoff run the way everybody's falling apart. So, um, you know, I think Sacramento uh, did well as well. So teams got what they want. Nobody is forced to trade, but over the long haul, Somebody like Washington, um, it, to me, it was not. It, when, you, when you're trading Otto Porter and you're, you're trading Marquise Morris and you're trading guys that made you competitive and uh, you're looking at a total rebuild with a $42 million a year point guard who doesn't get to play for another year, I don't know how you can come out a winner. I'd say the biggest loser is the Washington Wizards. Would you agree with that, Eric? I'd actually say the biggest losers are, are the losers are LA Lakers. Um, you know, not only do they have to endure the rest of the season uh, where they might not make the playoffs, and you're going to have guys disgruntled. Uh, you know, we saw them coming off of uh, what was like a 39 or 40 point loss against Indiana, where you know LeBron was sitting at the end of the bench, and there were three seats in between him and the next closest guy. Um, that's a team that's you know that's a team full of guys who are just not really in the the, the mode of uh, you know playing hard right now. When you get blown out by almost 40 points on the road. Uh, those are a bunch of guys who LeBron basically wanted out of town. Every t guy on the team was involved in trade discussions except LeBron James. So that's a team that's probably not going to have a lot of motivation to play very well. Uh, those guys needed to go. And uh, whether you agree with what LeBron and his group did or not, um, it was probably best that a trade happened. Now the Lakers are kind of playing out this season. They're just playing out the string now because they don't have Anthony Davis. They can't make another trade. They're going to go get buyout guys. They're talking about bringing in Carmelo Anthony. That's not going to save their season. So I think the Lakers are the big losers from that standpoint. And then they're also the big losers in that once this thing gets to the summer, Boston becomes a player in the trade discussions. New York becomes a player in the trade discussions for Anthony Davis too because of uh, the pick that they're going to have that's supposed to be pretty high. They have a good chance of getting that number one pick, which would than Zion Williamson. Even the Clippers will become a discussion in those, uh, become a player in those trade discussions, you know, with the picks that they've accumulated and some of the players that they have. So, you know, the Lakers to me are the big loser of this trade deadline. Uh, they needed to get that Anthony Davis deal done. And now, you know, there are a lot of other factors in play for people to go get Anthony Davis along with them. That's a good point. When we're looking at trade deadline in a bubble, so often we look at the actual trades, but there's so much going on because we're talking about people here. We're not just talking about straight up transactions. Transaction wise, though, we saw a lot happening in the East. How much better do you guys think the East is, if at all? Well, you know, teams like Philly, like Barry was talking about, Philly got a lot better with Tobias Harris. Uh, that's a serious, you know, all star caliber starting power forward. You know, Marcus All. Uh, you know, you question the Raptors giving up a little bit of their depth in order to get Marc Gasol, but at the same time, you know, they add a frontline starter, a guy who's a really good defensive center, uh, just a great passer. Um, and frankly, you're not going to play that many guys in the playoffs anyway. So once those rotations shorten, the, 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 the Raptors were still able to keep, you know, the, the core rotation guys that they like, Pascal Siakam, uh, OG Anobi, and, uh, and Fred Van Vliet, their backup point guard. So those are two teams that got really strong. Boston might regret not making a move here, but they've already got a team that 
that's really strong itself. And Gordon Hayward's got some upside. Maybe he can get back into a rhythm and become the player or closer to the player than he was before he had that ankle injury last season. He hasn't looked very good all season at all. So, you know, the East is stacked. You know, the top four teams in the East, it's going to be rugged. And then we already talked about Milwaukee, too. So, I mean, the top four teams in the East, you'd probably rank ahead of the top four teams in the West right now. Only thing is the best team in the West is Golden State, and they're probably going to win the title. Next, there's still going to be movement, even though we're past the trade deadline, we're moving into the buyout market. Barry, for you, obviously, have more buyouts as we approach March. But for you right now, which guys on the market are, are the most desirable for teams out there? Well, I think uh, one of the guys, of course, uh, fairly prominent, Wesley Matthews. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the Rockets certainly be interested in Wesley Matthews. The Thunder would be interested in Wesley Matthews. The Warriors probably be interested in Wesley Matthews. But he seems like uh, perhaps the best fit could be in Indiana, where uh, the Pacers have lost Victor Oladipo. And Wesley Matthews is like a, uh, a, a reasonable facsimile, older, a little slower, not quite as good, but very reasonable facsimile to Victor Oladipo. And for a team that was right there with all these powers in the East that we were talking about. Indiana was in number three seed when, when Oladipo goes down. If they could find a vo fill that void just a little, Indiana would stay ahead of the pack in the East, finish no worse than fifth, and, and give uh, somebody, one of those four Eastern heavyweights, a really good first round uh, playoff series. So if Wesley Matthews goes to Indiana, he could elevate, I think, the uh, Pacers more than he could elevate the Thunder, the Rockets, or the Warriors. No, there's some intriguing guys all over the league. There's some guys who haven't even been bought out yet, but you know, there's some talks around them. I think Wayne Ellington's a guy who's going to get bought out in Phoenix. He was traded from the Heat to, the, to Phoenix this week. Uh, he's a shooter, a guy that can add some spacing on the perimeter for any team. I mean, with some of the teams that Barry mentioned, Houston, Golden State, the Thunder, you know, even Philly uh, will still be in the market for him because Philly's depth is sapped coming off of their bench. Uh, you know, and Wayne Ellington, I think he's a Philly guy. I think he Wayne grew up Ellington is a Philly guy, so that would be a perfect fit for him. Uh, no, another guy that uh, hasn't been uh, released yet, but look, the Clippers don't have any use for a lot of these guys on their roster. They're not trying to win games. They're trying to get into the free agency market. Uh, two guys who came from the Memphis Grizzlies, Jermichael Green, power forward. Uh, he can stretch it. He can shoot 39.4%. That's what he's been shooting this year from three. He'd be a good addition off the bench at the stretch four position. Garrett Temple, longtime veteran, nine-year guy. Uh, he's played a couple different places, but he can be a three and D wing that can come off the bench and, and help a lot of teams. And look, our old friend from Oklahoma, he played here for a few years, Ennis Canner. he's going to be on the market. Uh, he's a guy who the Knicks recently bought out. Uh, he's a guy who can come off the bench, more of a traditional center, power forward player, and he can get you an easy 10 and 10 on any night. And look, he has his defensive liabilities, but he's a guy, if you give him the right minutes and balance him against some second units, he can go get 10 rebounds and get some easy buckets. He's one of the best post players in the league, and certainly there's going to be a market for him if there's a market for a guy like Carmelo Anthony who hasn't played all season, basically. So, you know, there's some good players out there, and, uh, you know, they all have their deficiencies, but, you know, teams are going to be looking for those little upgrades here and there, and it'll be interesting to see what happens before March 1st. Yeah, still a lot to keep track of bef between now and then. Thank you guys so much for joining me. From Gatehouse Media and The Oklahoman, I'm Maddie Lee.